What if I made Ruby Volume 9? I've been rather nonplussed by Ruby and Rooster Teeth in general lately, and after seeing the less than impressive trailer for Volume 9, I realized I probably hate it already. Now I don't want to put the cart before the horse, as far as I know it could be fun, but from how the trailer presents its tone, the characters, the set pieces, I was not thrilled with how it seems the direction of the show is going to be going for Volume 9. So screw it, I'll just do it myself. A fun little fan version of how I would do volume 9. I'm not changing anything. I'm literally treating this as if the writers just dumped all of Ruby on my lap and told me to figure it all out for volume 9. Also, I'm just gonna disregard everything we've seen from the trailers and teasers for volume 9 because I don't like any of it. I'd rather just do my own thing. So here we go. Let's not waste any more time. This is gonna be a bit like a big ol' audiobook. I hope you enjoy. Episode 1, Curiouser and Curiouser. The first thing we hear is the sound of lapping waves, intercut every now and then with a sudden splash, followed by rummaging sounds and scraping metal. Hard cut to the Aesop's Robin and Crow. They're standing on top of some leftover rubble, perhaps the top of a particularly large building from Atlas, just barely jutting out of the ocean water. Crow is trying to push debris out of his way, trying to get into the building from a damaged part in its roof. He's clearly upset. Robin tells him to give it up already. Crow says he can't stop. He's gotta find Ruby, Yang, Oscar, all the kids. He can't give up on them. They gotta be here. Marrow and Elm are looking over the ship, assessing the situation, and Harriet is standing by herself a little bit further away. They discuss what they should do, if anyone could have survived. Crow finally uncovers a large piece of debris, only to find that the building seems to also be fully flooded with water, and he screams and sits down, frustrated. Robin says they won't be able to do anything as they are. They should find help. Elm decides they should fly to Argus, try to get the soldiers to help them dig up Atlas and Mantle. Harriet says, what's the point? It's all flooded. You don't really think anyone survived, do you? Crow says that they have to be alive. They can't give up now. He won't lose another loved one again. With that, the sound of the waves transition us to a beach on the island of Ever After, and Ruby is sitting upright as she wakes up. The beach is entirely empty. No stones, no shells, nothing but a flat plain, and trees on the distance. Ruby looks around and has nothing. She sees no one. She doesn't know where she is, and after wringing out the excess water from her cape, she starts heading towards the large trees that she can see through the jungle. As she does, she starts meekly calling out, Yang? Blake? Yang! Blake! As she disappears into the tree line, we see some mysterious snake-like thing slithering past. We cut to a different beach, adorned with large stones that jut out of the beach that are designed to look like swords. Waking up is Weiss. She looks around and realizes she's still holding on to both her rapier and also Blake's gamble shroud. She hears a groaning sound and sees Jean slowly stirring awake nearby. She calls after him and the two are happy to see each other are alive and seemingly uninjured. They question where they are, what to do. Weiss notes that if Blake is here too, she's going to need her weapon back. Jean seems tired, and Weiss asks if he wants to talk about Penny. Jean says no, but tries to cover up his sad emotions by saying, Look on the bright side. Cinder didn't get the maiden powers. Penny gave them to Winter, and she made it through to Vacuo, so she'll be okay, right? Now it's Weiss's turn to look sad and worried. The two decide not to sit around moping, they have to find the rest of Team Ruby. We cut to Salem and Cinder, landing on a sharp cliff edge. Salem is in high spirits, and Cinder is trying to hide how tired she is from flying all the way there. Salem uses how pathetic humanity are, needing a relic of the gods to create things when she can already create Grimm however she wants all on her own. Cinder eagerly asks, do you want me to head to Vacuo now, your grace? And Salem surprises her by laughing. By yourself? Cinder, please. Cinder is flabbergasted and stammers out, I got you these two relics, didn't I? I'm more than capable. Salem interrupts her again in a slightly more stern voice. Yes, Cinder. Your first true accomplishment in what feels like a lifetime. Need I remind you that you wouldn't have succeeded in getting these relics or your maiden powers without all the help you've received from others? Watts's technology, Leo forging your transcripts. You allied yourselves with thieves, the White Fang, and you've left a trail of failure everywhere you've gone. You've lost the Spring Maiden, and now the Winter Maiden. Just because you cut everyone else off at the end, that doesn't actually mean you did it all on your own. Cinder, crushed, says nothing. Salem tells her to find more reinforcements before heading to Vacuo, and make sure it's women she finds. Cinder nods, confused by this last statement, and Salem gives her a stern stare. 
I'm tired of you losing the maiden powers one after another. Bring more women with you and make sure at least one of you becomes the summer maiden. I will not tolerate any more failure from you. Cinder, gritting her teeth angrily, flies off, wobbling from exhaustion as she disappears into the night. We cut to Yang, waking up on another beach. The beach she's on is covered in seashells, and little black, red glowing crabs are crawling all around her. Yang looks closer at one of the crabs, and we can see it definitely isn't a grim, but it's also nothing like a real crab either. Yang looks around and suddenly gasps. No, 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 she says over and over as the camera pulls out, revealing Penny's lifeless hand. I wouldn't want to show her body, though. I don't want it to be, like, gory. We cut to Blake waking up on a different beach, covered in beautiful red coral that seem to have a petal-like flutter to them. Blake looks around, confused, and finds Crescent Rose sticking out of the sand. She looks around and takes it with her, struggling to handle the cumbersome scythe. How does Ruby collapse this thing? She asks herself, looking at all the different buttons and intricate machinery. As she struggles with it, she accidentally fires a round. The echoing bullet cuts to each of the others reacting to the sound. Weiss and John together, just entering the tree line. Ruby in the thick of some vines and other vegetation. Yang, next to a mound of sand where she was kneeling. A large seashell decorated near one end of it. This is Penny's grave, and Yang has carved Here Lies Penny, a real girl, into the seashell for the gravestone. These would all be really quick reaction shots. Then, cutting back to Blake, grimacing at the sudden loud noise she just made. Suddenly, a low droning sound catches her attention, and she turns down the beach. We can see a large, bird-like creature starts awkwardly rushing towards her. Again, this creature is clearly not a grim, but not a real animal either. For the sake of brevity, I'll just tell you what this thing is. It's called a jub-jub bird. Blake scrambles, trying to fire at the creature with Crescent Rose, but can't get the angle right due to the scythe's weight, and then the two fight. Blake scrambles to get Crescent Rose to cooperate with her, until ultimately she finally figures out how to collapse it all the way down to its gun mode, and she can figure out how to use it with her semblance now that it's a more manageable size. Noticeably, we see every time Blake uses her semblance, the red coral littering the beach will noticeably glow and create more petals like flutters. Blake manages to finally defeat the jub jub bird, and when it dies, it sort of just turns into a puddle and disappears. Blake breathes a sigh of relief and finally starts heading towards the tree line. We cut to Ruby, looking around towards the sky, frantically running. She's still calling out Yang and Blake's names. When, in her hurry, suddenly something new jumps out of the bushes towards her. It's the lizard-like creature called Bill the Lizard. Ruby uses her semblance and starts running from Bill, but the lizard is fast and easily is keeping up with her. The two slip around tree roots, vines, rocks, and all other kinds of things, never breaking their extreme speed. Also, every time we see Ruby using her semblance, the vines on the trees noticeably rattle in an ominous sounding way. Basically, every time we see someone using their semblance in the environment, the environment around them will have some sort of clear, visible reaction to it. Then, as it all seems to be coming to a head, Ruby makes a hard rush and tumbles right off the edge of a sheer drop. Falling once again, she screams and watches as Bill the Lizard turns away from the edge of the cliff as Ruby falls into darkness. We fade to black. We cut to someone's point of view as they push through vines, and we can hear murmured voices and heavy breathing. Suddenly, they pull back vines and reveal a small crowd of Atlesian and Mantle civilians. Was that gunfire? Are there others on this island? Where are we? What happened? I'm scared! We change angles to see the person whose point of view we've been seeing, and it's Neo. She looks around at the shuffling crowd, angry and dazed. As one of the civilians passes in front of the camera, suddenly Neo has black hair and green eyes, wearing tattled mantle-style clothes. She stumbles towards the crowd and glares around as we cut to black. Cue awesome anime intro, end of the episode. Episode 2, Lost in the Storm. The episode starts with Grimm being killed in the deserts of Vacuo. Team Honor, Oscar, Nora, Emerald, and Ren, and Winter are all separated, surrounding the crowd of civilians, protecting them from the various Grimm around them. As they all kill off some Grimm, they look around, clearly tired. The Grimm horde seems to have subsided, but the windstorms are still raging. Winter, at the front of the crowd, looks back at everyone. Maybe we should all stop and rest a moment? We see people sitting down, some crying, some eating. Willow and Whitley huddle together as Klein tends to people's wounds. Team Honor starts debating with each other. Ren doubts if this was the right choice. Emerald asks if Vacuo is even nearby, and Oscar says it's hard to tell. The desert is always changing. It's hard to navigate even with a map. 
Nora is clearly anxious. She insists on rushing ahead to look for shelter or something, and she tells Ren to shoot her with an electric bullet to juice her up. He says no, and she goes, fine, I'll just do it myself. And she and Ren scramble with one of his guns, trying to wrestle away from each other. There's suddenly a loud roar of Grimm again. Another swarm of Grimm start to emerge from the sandstorm, and as everyone starts to get ready to fight again, suddenly a large flare shoots out from the storm into the Grimm. A small battalion of people come running out of the storm to help kill off the Grimm, being led by a woman who is a very tall faunus with black hair and dog ears. Her and the rest of the battalion are from Vacuo, and before Team Honor can say something, she starts to shout out, Is this an act of war? How did so many people get to the desert? Are you soldiers? Are you from Atlas? Mantle? Did Vale finally run out of resources? Suddenly a voice cuts from the battalion, saying, No, wait, I know them! Pushing through to stand next to the dog faunus woman is Velvet. Behind her appears the rest of Team Coffee, and them and Team Honor start talking. What's going on here? What happened? There's a lot to say, but first we need to get these refugees out of the desert. The faunus woman, whose name is Tatiana Steele, says, And do you think Vacuo can hold this many people? Team Honor argues that they have no other options right now, and she begrudgingly agrees to take them all in. Team Coffee and the rest of the battalion start to lead all the refugees. Winter lights up her eyes and starts to fly towards the front of the group. When Tatiana grabs her wrist, Tatiana says in a stern, whispered voice, What do you think you're doing flying around like that? Winter tries to pull her arm back, saying, I'm protecting them. And Tatiana replies with, Put your glowy eyes away before you make yourself pass out. Winter grimaces and pulls her arm back, using her magic to fly to the front of the crowd before landing in front of them all and walking alongside them from now on, her eyes no longer glowing. We cut to Jean and Weiss, using their swords to carve a path through the vegetation. Jean stops, taking a heavy breath, and staring sadly at his broken sword, clearly not doing as good a job as he could be if it wasn't in shambles. As Weiss keeps going, he says, What are we even doing? Weiss doesn't answer, and Jean keeps saying, We don't even know where we're going, Weiss. What if this is all pointless? Weiss interrupts him, saying sharply, I know we don't know where we are, Jean. I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what else we can do. But if we're here, that means Yang and Ruby and Blake are probably here, too. And we have to find them before that crazy Neapolitan girl finds them. Jean doesn't move. He just sort of watches as Weiss keeps cutting through. Finally, he says, Weiss, let's stop for a moment. No, she yells. I don't want to stop. I'm so sick of sitting around and waiting for terrible things to happen to us. Jean steps up and starts helping her chop through the vines again, and the two share a wry smile. They start to talk about how they feel, thoughts on Penny, their worries. Basically, it would just be a good excuse for them to express how they feel about everything they've recently gone through. After their conversation, we cut back to Ruby, opening her eyes, startled, looking around and seeing that she's tangled up in various vines, holding her up above an empty darkness below her. She scrambles a bit and sees an open cavern in the walls of the cliffs around her. She easily flies into a large cavern with her semblance and looks down into the cavern. It's lined with various glowing crystal stones that, upon further inspection, are actually shaped like various flowers. With a tired sigh, Ruby starts to head into the cavern. We cut back to Team Honor and the refugees entering the kingdom of Shade, and Tatiana leads them over towards a regal-looking man, Headmaster Rumple. Winter goes with Tatiana to explain the situation and everything that has happened, when Team Honor hears someone calling out to them. They look over and are shocked to see Team Sun and Ilya. Before they can talk, however, Rumple calls Team Honor over. We cut to the inside of his office. Team Honor and Winter are there with him and Tatiana. Winter and the others explain what all happened with Atlas and Mantle, explaining how the relics from Mantle and Atlas are now both gone and the enemy are already on their way to Vacuo too. They ask if the Summer Maiden is in a secure location, where Tatiana laughs and says, I'm more than capable of keeping myself protected. That's when we see her eyes glow with that signature Maiden ability. She goes on to say, There's no way in hell Vacuo would fall like Atlas or Beacon. We're built to withstand the storms and are stronger than your average students. Team Honor and Winter agree to help out with taking care of the Atlas refugees. They need to figure out where they can send all these people because they all certainly can't stay here. They also need to help keep the Relic and the Maiden safe, especially since they know Tyrion and Mercury are already on their way. On that note, we cut to Team Sun, Ilya, and Team Coffee, all talking with each other, trying to make sense of what's going on. Hidden in the alleyways of the city, though, we see Tyrion and Mercury looking on at all the commotion. What the hell happened? Mercury whispers, looking at the large crowd. Who are all these people? 
It doesn't matter, Tyrion whispers back, clearly not interested. With all these people, it will be even easier for us to blend in. Remember, kid, this isn't going to be like your last few failures. This remark makes Mercury visibly angry, but he doesn't say anything. Tyrion continues. We won't be charging in recklessly like Cinder always insists on doing. We're going to be shadows, understand? We will not be seen, we will not be heard, and we will wait until the exact precise moment to strike. It's like hunting. You've gone hunting before, right? Mercury just looks away from Tyrion. Tyrion stifles laughter. We cut back to Jean and Weiss, the sun now starting to get dark on the island. They're now more just pushing the vines out of their way rather than cutting through them. Exhausted, Jean says, Hey Weiss, remember when we went to Beacon? Yeah, she says. He says, This sort of reminds me of when we were in the Emerald Forest. Isn't this kind of similar? If by similar you mean being completely lost, then yeah, I think it is kind of the same. The two start to chuckle when suddenly they hear a noise up ahead. They share a look and rush forward, and as they burst through a large patch of vines, they find themselves in front of the crowd of civilians, who are all arguing with each other in front of a bonfire. End of episode. Episode 3. Found. Night has fallen on the island. Yang is slowly trudging along the path in the forest, talking to herself. How could this happen? Who could do something like that to Penny? It had to be Cinder. She killed Penny. She got the maiden powers. Everything has been for nothing. And this, she stops looking around, must be heaven, right? I'm dead, right? If Penny's here and she was dead, ugh, maybe not. She punches a tree in frustration. I might as well be, though. Maybe this is just a bad dream. She slides down the tree, sitting in the dirt. She looks up at the sky, and we get a good look at the fact that the stars actually move around, like they fluctuate between shades of pink, blue, and purple. Yang sighs, burying her face into her hands, and we transition over to Blake, who is also sitting on the ground, her back against a rock, holding onto Crescent Rose tightly. I'm sorry I couldn't hold on to you, Ruby, she says quietly to herself. Just like Yang, just like all of it, I finally stopped running away, and I'm still alone. We cut to Crow, staring out the window of the airship. They're flying in silence. None of the Aesops are looking at each other, and Robin, who's driving, glances back at them all in the rearview mirror. So, she says, trying to cut the tension, are the renowned Aesops always this much fun? We watched one of our teammates die, Harriet says quickly and sharply. We're not in the mood to have fun. Crow snaps suddenly and angrily with, And whose fault was that? You were the one dead set on dropping a bomb. Harriet turns away, quietly saying, I know it's my fault. I still miss fine, though. Right, Robin says. I'm sorry, I was just... It's fine, Elm says sternly, moving to sit in the co-pilot seat next to Robin. We just need to focus. Focus on what? Marrow groans. Flying endlessly? What's even the point? Look! Crow calls out suddenly. Marrow and Harriet rush to look out the window, too. They gasp as they see the giant crashed Amity Arena in the middle of the tundra. They fly over to the wreckage, and emerging from the arena, Maria and Pietro come out, waving their arms and calling out to them. You're alive, Crow exclaims, running to meet them. And you're with the Aesops? Maria asks, looking at the others behind him. It's only been two days. How much did we miss? Pietro approaches and says, Where is Penny and the other kids? Crow looks downcast, glancing back at the others in the airship, and says sternly, We don't know, but they're alive. I just know it. They all have to be alive. Crow, Harriet says suddenly, we need to be reasonable. They are alive, Crow yells back. Maria steps towards Harriet. What do you mean? What's happened? The Aesops glance at each other, uncomfortable, and Crow sighs heavily. We cut back to Yang, still staring up at the sky, sadly, when suddenly some movement across from her catches her attention. Emerging from the foliage is a strange turtle-like monster. This is the Mock Turtle. Yang stares at it in confusion, and it shambles towards her weirdly. It stares back at her, and she slowly starts to stand up. Hello, she says awkwardly. What are you supposed to be? As she finishes her sentence, it lunges towards her, snapping at her feet, and Yang backpedals, firing around at it. The bullet bounces off of the large shell, and it gets mad, quickly rushing at her. Yang fires some more shots and starts to run away, the mock turtle roaring as it chases her. It's just a dream. It's just a dream. It's just a dream, she says frantically to herself as she runs. We cut to Blake, asleep, still holding onto Crescent Rose, almost like it's a teddy bear. And she's awoken by the sound of Yang's shotguns echoing around her. She scrambles to her feet and sees the glow of the bullet rounds within the darkness of the trees. She holds up Crescent Rose uncertainly and starts to slowly creep forward. 
Cutting back to Yang, who's trying to launch various attacks at the mock turtle, and everything just bounces off of its shell. She scrambles and trips over a tree root, crashing to the ground. The mock turtle launches towards her when suddenly a bullet comes from beyond Yang and knocks the mock turtle over. Who's there? Blake yells out, and Yang, hearing her voice, rolls onto her feet. Blake? Yang yells out, confused yet thrilled. Blake's ears perk up and she takes a step closer to the tree line. Y- Yang? She calls back. Yang stands up and the two girls finally see each other, tears instantly coming to Blake's eyes. Yang still stunned with surprise, but the roaring of the mock turtle interrupts the moment as it charges back towards Yang again. Blake scrambles with Crescent Rose and Yang yells, Is that Ruby's scythe? Why do you have that? Yang runs up to Blake and Blake yells, Help me with this thing! Yang reaches Blake, pulling the right mechanisms to get the scythe to unfold again, and the mock turtle leaps through the air towards them. Together, Yang and Blake swing the scythe, chopping the mock turtle in half, and as it dies, it becomes a splatter of liquid. The girls turn to each other and immediately hug one another. What? What are you doing here? Yang asks. What even is this? Yang, I'm sorry, Blake says. I thought you were dead, and I tried to save you, but I just couldn't reach... And I couldn't hold on to Ruby either. Ruby? Yang asks. Ruby's here too? Yeah, we both fell together. Cinder betrayed Neo and I tried to grab Ruby and... And... Upon hearing Cinder's name, Yang frowns. Cinder, she says angrily. Blake looks back at her confused. It was Cinder who did it, wasn't it? Blake looks even more confused. Did what? Penny, Yang says. Blake starts to look concerned now. What happened to Penny? Yang takes a step back. I found her at the beach. She's dead. Blake covers her mouth, muffling a quiet no of disbelief. Blake sinks to her knees and Yang kneels down too. What about Weiss? Juniper? Everyone else? What happened? Yang asks. I don't know, Blake says sadly. Blake covers her face, wiping away the tears, and Yang holds on to her again. End of episode. Episode 4, At Wit's End. The episode opens up on Team Honor, waking up in the Shade Academy. As they eat breakfast, Team Coffee, Sun, and Ilya come to sit with them. Notably, they all have very small food portions. Nora says the rationing for all the refugees must be difficult for Shade. They all chat for a while, basically just using the scene as a good excuse for them to bounce off each other, highlight their personalities, talk a bit, have some fun, express themselves. Then Winter and Tatiana approach them, telling them not to get comfy. They have a lot of work ahead of them today. They have different missions they could work on, looking for more food, guarding the city from Grimm. Others need to start organizing the refugees into groups, figuring out where they can all go, and they can start getting some airships ready for them to head out. Ren sighs and rubs his eyes. More missions, just like Atlas. And Tatiana quickly snaps, Hey, I don't want to hear any whining, especially not from any of you ladies. She points towards the girls at the table. I'll be keeping an eye on all of you. If I bite the dust, I'm going to have to know which one of you ladies will have to take the maiden powers. Really? Winter says. Are you planning on biting the dust soon? Of course, Tatiana says bluntly. I didn't get to live this long without being prepared for anything and everything, and that means you all should be prepared too. Coco speaks up and says, I would gladly be the next summer maiden, Tatiana. Hey, Nora says sharply, I think I would be a pretty good summer maiden. Ilya and Velvet also speak up, and the girls start discussing why they could be the best pick for the summer maiden. Oscar turns and notices Emerald isn't saying anything, just watching the discussion. Not interested in getting the maiden powers for yourself? He asks, and Emerald waves a hand. Pass. I've had enough of maidens in my life. As the team get ready to head out, Team Honor start arguing about what they want to do. It becomes clear they don't really have any leadership between them and end up splitting up. Nora goes with Team Sun to fight Grimm, Ren goes with Team Coffee to hunt and forage for food, and Oscar and Emerald go with Ilya to organize the refugees. We get a scene with Nora talking to Team Sun, where they can just talk to each other. Nora would be clearly frustrated, wanting to get revenge for Jean and Team Ruby. Ren would get to talk to Coffee, and we learn Ren is feeling awfully standoffish. He's being blunt, and when they ask him about Jean and Team Ruby, Ren would insist they're fine. They have to be, right? But in a distant sort of way. Oscar, Emerald, and Ilya try to talk to the refugees. They all just want to go back to Atlas and Mantle. Come on, people, that's not really an option right now, Emerald says. Isn't there anywhere else in the world you want to go? Haven, menagerie. Menagerie? And be around those animals? An Atlesian refugee says. 
Ilya takes an angry step towards them. What did you just say? All that happens is an argument breaks out and Oscar tries to calm everyone down, reminding them that the Grimm will be attracted to them if they start fighting. Oscar would seem sort of deflated by the whole mess and Emerald would start trying to step up and be more helpful, insisting she still needs to earn his trust. We cut to Ruby, wandering around the crystal flower cave. Suddenly, down the way, she sees movement, familiar long blonde hair. Yang, she calls out, running forward, and we can clearly see Yang running in Ruby's direction too. But when Ruby reaches her, she runs into what looks like a glass wall. It's like a flat crystal surface that's actually a bit like a mirror, only instead of Ruby's reflection being herself, it's Yang. Confused, Ruby takes a step back and turns to see the walls lining the rest of the cave are all covered in these crystal-like mirrors. Only reflected in all of them are people other than herself. Blake in one, Weiss in another, Jean, Ty, Oscar, Crow, Maria. Ruby starts running past the mirrors, trying to turn away from the reflections, then quickly stops. Reflecting in front of her is Pyrrha. Ruby starts to tear up and covers her mouth. The Pyrrha reflection does the same. Ruby turns around quickly and suddenly shouts. The next reflection is Summer Rose. Ruby yells frustratedly and starts running, the mirrors seemingly spinning around her. Ruby slamming into mirrors and bouncing off the walls, trying to navigate through them, a into a house of mirrors. She is breathing heavy, panting, lost, and suddenly a small voice. Ma'am? Ruby turns, screaming in surprise. We see a little girl who almost looks human, but not quite. She's human-shaped, but her skin is pure white. All of her features are a pure, solid color. She feels almost abstract. She's wearing a dress adorned with what looks like a crude A shape on the front, and a lattice-like crisscrossing pattern decorating it. She has pure black hair and a yellow diamond obscuring one of her eyes. She speaks again. Ma'am, are you okay? Are you lost? Ruby, flabbergasted, manages to ask the girl her name, and she answers, Lattice Calloway. Lattice offers to show Ruby out of the cave. Confused but grateful, Ruby agrees. As she leads her out, Ruby asks what's wrong with the mirrors, and Lattice explains that these are looking glasses, and they show you the people you love and care about who also love and care about you. At least that's how Lattice thinks it works. All she sees is her own reflection. Lattice leads Ruby out of an opening and Ruby blinks into the morning light. Ruby's in a clearing. There are tall walls surrounding her and a bit of a waterfall and a river running past. Exasperated, Ruby looks around asking, where even am I? What does it matter? I can't find anyone. I can't find Yang or Blake. What's the point? Ruby's clearly angry and upset, collapsing to the ground, burying her head in her hands. Lattice gently pats Ruby's head, and Ruby looks back up at her, and Lattice smiles sadly. It'll be okay. I'll help you. Promise. Feeling a bit better, Ruby accepts Lattice's help. We cut to Jean and Weiss. Both are trying to talk over the arguing civilians, but they're not being heard. The civilians are arguing about what they should do, what they're supposed to eat, accusing each other of stealing each other's supplies, trying to find someone to blame for their situation. Please listen to us, Weiss says sternly. Why should we? An exasperated mother snaps at her. You were supposed to protect us, and look how that's worked out for us. No, no, Jean insists, stepping between them. We didn't know someone was going to attack us. We're trying to do our best. What about the protector of Mantle? Another man says. Jean and Weiss visibly deflate. She was supposed to protect us, and she couldn't stop that crazy fire lady. The arguing continues, and Jean and Weiss take a step back. They talk to each other about what they're supposed to do. They can't just leave these people behind. They need to protect them. It's their fault they're in this mess, right? Both Jean and Weiss seem very downcast. As we watch the civilians continue to panic, we get a glimpse of disguised Neo peering angrily towards Weiss and Jean. Weiss starts looking around and groans, using her semblance to create a bee summon. The sudden summon quiets the crowd a little in amazement, and she flies up over the tree line looking around. She looks around the island and something catches her eye. Lights and what looks like a trail of smoke from a campfire not too far in the distance. She calls out to Jean, telling him what she's found, and they start leading the civilians in that direction. They break through some vegetation, gasping as they see it's not just a campfire. It's an entire town, filled with people who all look akin to Lattice. Human, but not quite. Their skin, hair, and eyes are all pure white, stark black, a pinkish red, or a saturated yellow. They all have either a heart, diamond, spade, or a club decorated on them somewhere. And they all look amazed as the civilians enter their town. End of the episode. Episode 5, Wonder Realm. We start with Cinder, standing in front of a familiar building, and she confidently kicks open the doors to Little Miss Malachite's establishment. 
Little Miss looks up from her seat in the back, frowning while all the spider-tattooed patrons jump up, readying their various weapons. Cinder, completely unbothered by them, walks confidently towards Little Miss, who says, Well, you've got yourself a new look. New attitude. Cinder stops in front of her, putting her hands on her hips. New arm. Little Miss says, staring at Cinder's grim arm. I'm guessing that little friend of yours from last time didn't work out for you, huh? I'm looking for people to hire. I need to bring some women with me on an assignment to Vacuo. She and Little Miss have a little bit of a back and forth, debating on why she should help Cinder. Cinder threatens her, and after a bit of dialogue, Little Miss suggests that she takes her nieces with her, revealing Melanie and Milsha coming out of the shadows. The twins don't seem too excited to go with Cinder, but they also make it clear they don't particularly like staying with Little Miss. And Cinder's promise of getting power intrigues the girls, and they leave with Cinder. Weiss, Jean, and the civilians look around amazed at the strange new town they've stumbled into. An excited voice calls out to them, and an impressively large woman with more red in her design than most of the others comes stomping up towards them. Who are you, new friends in my domain? It is a pleasure, darlings, she yells, bouncing as she speaks. Your domain, another more shrill voice yells out. Another impressively tall woman, with more white in her design than most of the others, saunter up. Rosalind Heartstopper, you know I am the true queen of the Wonder Realm. Don't lie to our new guests. Ha, Rosalind says. Don't make me laugh, Miss Whitney Stronghold. The two women start bickering with each other, drawing a crowd of people around the civilians. Weiss groans and whispers, What a tiresome couple of characters, huh? Jean stifles a laugh and says, Actually, they kind of remind me of you and Ruby. Weiss huffs angrily and says, I beg your pardon. Rosalind and Whitley's bickering gets louder, and Rosalind says, You're a big stupid jerk and I hate you. Whitney answers with a loud groan, saying, Come on, act properly in front of guests. Rosalind mimics her and goes, Wah, act properly in front of guests. Why are you so bossy? I'm not bossy, Whitney says. Jean gives Weiss a glance and she grimaces. Weiss and Jean interrupt the two and try to explain they're not from around here and want to get back to where they come from, explaining Ambrosius and his portals. When they mention Ambrosius, Rosalind and Whitney stop and suddenly call out, Ambrosius Craftsmith! A person pushes his way through the crowd, and though he's designed like the other Wonder Realm people, he also clearly resembles Ambrosius to some degree, and behind him is another woman who resembles Jin to some degree. Ambrosius insists he didn't do anything, and once the queens start bickering again, Weiss asks the gin-looking woman if there's somewhere they could all rest for a moment. Noticing the two queens are too busy arguing, Jin nods and leads Weiss, Jean, and the civilians past the debating. We cut to Blake and Yang, traversing a new area together, talking to each other about what they think, how they feel about not only the place they're in, but how everything has worked out with Atlas, Mantle, Penny, wondering how the others are doing in Vacuo. As they chat, Blake seems downcast, and Yang asks her what's wrong, and Blake confesses how guilty she feels for not being able to hold on to Ruby, and not being able to save Yang at all. Wiping away some tears, Blake says, I felt like my heart had shattered into pieces, seeing you vanish. I don't ever want to feel that way again. I'll save you next time, I promise. Yang tries to tell Blake she shouldn't be blaming herself so much, and Blake says, Yang, I love you too much not to feel this way. And Yang smiles and grabs hold of Blake's hand and says, I love you too much to let you keep tearing yourself apart over it. Blake blinks and her eyes light up. Yang says, We're protecting each other, remember? Blake smiles, but they're suddenly interrupted by a hissing, roaring sound. We cut to Ruby, following Lattice along a river. Ruby is glaring down at her feet, muttering more to herself rather than actually talking to Lattice. We should have been able to beat Cinder. What's the point of becoming licensed huntresses if I can't even beat Cinder? What's the point of mastering my silver eyes if I don't use them when I should have? She goes on like this for a while, Lattice cheerily chiming in every now and then, when suddenly a roaring sound, the same one Blake and Yang heard, echoes around Ruby. Oh no, Lattice says, running to hide behind Ruby, holding onto her cape like a security blanket. It's a lost creature. What do we do, Miss Ruby Rose? Ruby looks around and sees the same Bill the Lizard that chased her down in episode one. She looks back at Lattice, who's clearly afraid, and looks around panicking, her hands shaking, and she realizes she has nothing to protect herself with and nowhere to run while she's in this little clearing. 
Build a lizard growls, running down the basin walls and charging through the river, heading straight towards Ruby and Lattice. Ruby bends down and tries to quickly pick up Lattice. Bill roars and jumps into the air when a bullet blasts it away from Ruby and Lattice. Ruby looks up and standing on top of the ridge is Blake and Yang. Blake has Crescent Rose out and a smoke trail coming from the barrel. Yang launches a few bullets into Bill and the lizard scrambles just to try to escape the barrage before finally another shot from Blake kills it. Ruby stares back at Blake and Yang who beam down at her. Yang immediately starting to slide down the basin walls to get to Ruby. Ruby starts to cry, smiling for the first time all volume, as she runs to meet with Yang and Blake in a giant group hug. End of the episode. Episode 6, Lights. It's nighttime in Vacuo. We see Emerald is awake and staring out a window at the academy when Nora calls out to her. Nora notes how Emerald's awake, and she says she couldn't sleep. Too much on her mind. And Nora solemnly agrees. Emerald asks if Nora thinks all the others died when they fell, and Nora says she thinks so. She asks Emerald if she thinks so too, and Emerald says she doesn't want to believe it, but she can't help but also think the same. The two girls get to talk a bit more about how they feel. Emerald expresses how she feels like she needs to be more helpful, constantly trying to prove that she deserves to be there, earning their trust, make up for the fact that the others fell, but she didn't. And Nora expresses how she feels so sick of everything. Sick of old people in charge who they can't trust, makes bad decisions, sick of them sitting around wasting their time doing the same things they were doing in Atlas, killing random Grimm, helping civilians with their petty problems. Did John and Team Ruby really die just for them to go back to busy work? Emerald tells Nora that no matter what they do, as long as they still try to protect the relics, then they didn't die in vain. And Nora tells Emerald that she has already gone through enough hurt, and she doesn't need to worry about proving herself to them. But Nora is definitely going to be the next Summer Maiden. Chuckling, Emerald disagrees, saying she'd make a way better Summer Maiden than Nora. We pan to the moon as they continue to playfully debate and transition over to Tyrion and Mercury, hiding behind a bunch of barrels and various supplies. Mercury angrily whispers, saying, We've been waiting for days now. How long are we going to keep wasting time? Tyrion, also whispering, laughs and says, That's the problem Cinder always had with her pawns. She's too brash, too impatient. Mercury asks what it is that they are doing, and Tyrion explains that they'll need a distraction before they can try to reach the Summer Maiden or the Vault. And the best way to do that is to cause a panic that'll set off the hordes and hordes of Grimm in the desert. Mercury asks how are they supposed to do that without drawing attention to themselves, and Tyrion laughs as he opens up one of the barrels, revealing it's full of various fruits. He picks up an apple and jabs his stinger into it. It glows a light purple color, saying to Mercury, you really must try to get creative, kid. We cut to Ruby, Blake, and Yang, still in that big hug from last time. As Ruby is saying how she thought she had lost Yang forever, Lattice starts tugging on her cape, asking, who are these new people, Miss Ruby Rose? Ruby goes, oh, um, this is Lattice. Lattice, this is my sister, Yang, and Yang interrupts her, saying, and this is Blake, my girlfriend. She holds Blake's hand and they smile at each other. Ruby also beams back at them. Ying grabs Ruby's hand with her other one and says, I was so worried about you, Ruby, especially after... Ying's voice trails off and Ruby asks, what? Ying, suddenly sheepish, says, after I found Penny. Ying suddenly pulls her hand back and glances at Blake, who looks sadly down at her feet. Ying, where is Penny? Why isn't she with you? Ying stammers, tears filling her eyes, and Ruby's expression drops. No, she says quietly, as she realizes what's wrong. Yang starts saying how she found her, buried her on a beach, didn't know what to do. Her and Blake starts talking, but their voices become drowned out as we focus on a close-up of Ruby's face, clearly distraught. She closes her eyes, tightly, tears falling down her cheeks. Suddenly, we see her eyelashes start to glow, and she opens her eyes, blinding the camera with an intense white light. We cut to a wide view of the island, and we see as her eyes flash silver, the whole island glows with her. Every plant brightens, every flower opens wider, the water shines, a luminescent glow comes off of every living thing. And we then see Jean and Weiss staring out the window of a strange building, watching as the island glows briefly and beautifully. Even the people of the Wonder Realm, Ambrosius and Jin, glow and their hair billows like they're in the wind before everything settles back to how it was. What was that? Weiss asks. I do not know, Jin says, looking out the window as well, but it's been happening a lot in the last few days. Maybe it has something to do with your arrival here? Weiss turns to look at the woman, looking her up and down and saying, 
You know, you look a lot like someone I've seen before. Your name wouldn't happen to be Jin, would it? She nods, saying, My name is Jin Pearsight, the resident prophet of the Wonder Realm. And this is my cousin, Ambrosius Craftsmith, one of our finest builders. You name it, he says, getting various things off of shelves and setting them up on a table. I can build it for you. Houses, furniture, weapons, armor, I can do it all. As he says the word weapons, Jean perks up, pulling out his broken sword, and goes to approach Ambrosius. Weiss announces herself as Weiss Schnee, and this is Jean Arc. Weiss looks over at the rest of the building. We can see the rest of the civilians sitting in various tables and chairs. The room they're in looks similar to like a lunch hall in a mall or a community center. Most of the civilians seem to be resting. Some are even chatting and having a few wry smiles on their faces. This is the most comfortable they've been in a long while. Jean hands his sword to Ambrosius, who looks it up and down. Strange materials you have here. What's it made of? Uh, steel or iron, I think? Jean says. Never heard of it, Ambrosius shrugs and starts to pull some stones and crystals off the shelf behind him. But I can think of something to fix it up. I'll have it ready for you by the morning. Meanwhile, Weiss looks back to Jin. Jin, maybe you can help me with something. Do you have any idea how to get out of this place? Maybe help us figure out how to get back to where we came from? Jin thinks for a second and says, the only thing I can think of is Yggdrasil. Weiss asks what that is and Jin says, the tree at the center of life. Jin gestures out the window and Weiss looks at the impossibly large tree in the center of her view. Yggdrasil is the birth of everything, and at the very top, in the center of the trunk, there's a hole that has no bottom. Things go in, but they never come back out. I don't know if it'll send you back to your home or not, though. Weiss thinks, saying, You said you're a prophet, right? Is there perhaps a way your prophecies could help confirm or deny your suspicions? Jin says, I can't always guarantee our prophecy will tell you what you really want to know, but I'll help you however I can. Come with me. As Weiss follows her, we transition back to Ruby, Yang, Blake, and Lattice. Yang is holding Ruby's head up, and she is pulling herself off the ground, holding her head with one hand. What was that, Miss Ruby Rose? You made the whole world light up, Lattice says excitedly. Ruby shakes her head, groaning. Yang asks if she's alright, and Ruby yells, No! Of course I'm not alright! She stands up, her hands bawling into fists. Penny's gone! Again! I've lost one of my best friends, someone I loved, again! And this time she can't even come back because we... because we... we... Her voice falters and Blake and Yang reach out towards her. Ruby pulls back. Because I decided to use the staff and make her a real girl. Atlas fell for nothing. We did that. We dropped Atlas onto Mantle for nothing. Penny is gone. Cinder has the maiden powers and the relic. Well, we don't know that for sure, Blake says, and Ruby shouts back, What else could have happened? All we've done is make everything worse. Yang steps up and says, No, we got everyone out of Atlas and Mantle. Did we? Ruby yells. If Penny couldn't stop Cinder, then who did? Even if everyone did make it to Vacuo, now what? Their homes are destroyed under Atlas. Salem has the relic, and it's all- Ruby, please stop! Yang yells, her voice causing Ruby to go quiet. Yang grabs both of Ruby's hands and hers, holding them close to her heart. Ruby, I know. I know how much this hurts. I know you want to be angry. Then yes. Be angry. I won't stop you from doing that, but I am going to stop you from convincing yourself it was all pointless. That it was all for nothing. Because we are still alive. Blake steps up and grabs Ruby's hands as Yang continues to speak. We'll figure this out, together. There hasn't been anything that could stop us yet. Because if we do give up now, then it all really would have been for nothing. And the Ruby I know never let anything stop her or get in her way. Not Roman Torchwick, not the White Fang, not Ironwood's army or Salem's goons, not even having to wait two extra years just to get into Beacon. Ruby chuckles and smiles at Yang and Blake. Blake says, We're here with you, Ruby. You've always been there for us, and we'll be here for you. The girls embrace and Lattice hugs Ruby's side. I'll help you too, Miss Ruby Rose. My sister Yang and Blake, my girlfriend. We transition away from the girls, hearing Yang saying, Oh, no, that's not, that, that's not our full names, as Ruby and Blake laugh. We cut back over to Weiss, sitting in a small room, decorated with beautiful tapestry. A crystal ball sits between her and Jin, who is taking a deep breath. Are you ready? Weiss nods. Jin says, I don't know what it is I'm saying, so do your best to remember it all. I will, Weiss says firmly. Jin nods and places her hands on the crystal ball, taking one last deep breath. Her eyes open and they're glowing. Weiss leans closer to her and Jin starts to speak, a slight reverb to her voice. Weiss Schnee, hear my voice. 
I see a glimpse of your future. Your future is bright, turbulent, like many colors spinning around you. All paths lead to Yggdrasil, but your destination is not where you are headed. Lost between locations, danger lies before you, more than just the beasts that roam this island. There is a joker shuffled into your deck. They intend to do you and the ones you hold closest to your heart lethal harm. Be cautious. The light fades from her eyes and Jin looks to Weiss, who was listening intently. Well, Jin asks, did you understand what I said? I think so, Weiss says, leaning back while she speaks. At least to some degree. What does a joker in my deck mean? We then cut to Jean and Ambrosius, chatting and looking at sword materials in the background. Sliding into frame is disguised Neo. She looks over her shoulder and quietly grabs one of Ambrosius's daggers off of a shelf, carefully hiding it in her sleeve. Her eyes narrow, and we cut to black. End of episode. Episode 7. Should have been me. The sun is just starting to rise as the Ace Ops' ship fly overhead of the familiar boot-looking base of Caroline Cordovan. She glares angrily up at the sky, watching as the ship lands in front of her base and Crow and the others step out. Mero takes the lead, approaching Cordo, and starts to say something, but she interrupts him by pushing past him and heading to Crow. What did you do? She yells, pointing at him. Crow looks deflated and tired. I let you and those children take one of my ships to Atlas, and the next thing I know, it's fallen into Mantle. What have you done? Robin steps between them, putting her hands up and saying, It's not his fault. It's true, Elm says, stepping up. Surely you saw the broadcast from Ruby. You know what's going on. Yes, I did see that red-hooded girl trying to make up lies about Ironwood. Where is she anyway? I want to give her a piece of my mind. Where is... Cordo cuts herself off suddenly. She's looking past them all. Robin, Elm, and Marrow turn around to see Crow's face again. He's crushed. Cordo says quietly, Oh, I see. Maria steps up and pushes Cordo on the shoulder. Be useful for once and tell us what you can about Vacuo. What's the report from there? Cordo's voice fades as we hear her saying, How should I know? Communications still can't reach Vacuo. The world around Crow darkens and he rubs his eyes. A horrible buzzing sound drones over everything. We cut to Vacuo. Team Honor are sitting down for breakfast. Nora, Emerald, and Oscar are all getting along. As Ren sits down, Oscar asks him how he slept, but Ren doesn't answer. They ask him again and Ren sort of mumbles a little something. Nora says, Hey, you've been real quiet ever since... Well, everything that happened. Do you want to talk to us about it? Ren shrugs and says, Talk about what? There's silence for a moment, and Oscar says, Talk about Jean, Team Ruby, Penny, any of what we went through in Atlas. It was a lot. Ren sort of shakes his head and says, What is there to talk about? I'd rather just wait for Jean and the others to come back. They glance at each other awkwardly, and Nora grabs Ren's hand. She says, Ren, as much as I wish we could believe that, we have to accept the fact that they might be dead. Ren cuts her off, saying, I don't want to believe that. I'm trying to stay positive. Why are you trying to stop that? Emerald says, it's not that we don't want you to be positive or whatever, it's just that it's not healthy to keep on pretending that- I don't get it, Ren snaps, standing up. I don't understand how you all can have so little faith in our friends. Ren walks off. Nora calls out to him, but he ignores it. He walks past Team Sun, and Sun calls out to him. Hey, Ren, want to help us out? We're going to start passing out rations to the refugees. Care to join us? Come on, all the boys hanging out? Ren agrees, and the boys start grabbing various barrels filled with fruits. Emerald, Oscar, and Nora discuss things. This would be a nice moment to get their thoughts on Ren, the idea of accepting if Team Ruby and Jean are actually dead. Basically just a good moment to have them develop together, and also have Nora and Oscar getting closer to Emerald. Transitioning back to Crow, he and the rest of his team are in the barracks of Cordovan's base. Elm is talking about the best ways to get to Vacuo. Harriet interrupts her saying, Stop trying to act like you're the leader now, Elm. A what? Marrow says. You think you deserve to be the leader of the Aesops now or something? Ugh, idiots, Harriet says, kicking a nearby chair. There is no more Aesops. Atlas is gone. Everyone's dead. What are we even doing anymore? Salem's unstoppable. You saw her and that giant crazy grim whale she had. There's no way we can stop her, so why waste our time? Marrow says. What, you want us to just lie down and give up? No, Harry and heels back. I want to spend my last few weeks living like I actually own my life. But Harriet, Elm says, stepping towards her. After everything we've been through, you can't just turn your back. Before she can finish, however, Harriet heels, watch me, and charges out of the room. 
Elm chases after her, and Marrow falls into one of the vacant beds, groaning angrily. Robin sighs and walks over to Marrow. She says, Well, Wags, quite the fun bunch you got there. He groans and says, This is not how I thought my military career would go. Well, Robin says, patting his shoulder, There's no point in sitting around moping. If they want to argue all day, let them. I'm dying for some real food. What do you say? You want to join? Pass, Marrow says dryly. Robin shrugs and says, Well, that's fine. What about you, Crow? You in the mood for? Before she can finish her sentence, she looks over at the chair Crow was sitting in and sees that he's not there anymore. We see Maria's eyes narrow as Robin says in the background, What? Is everyone just running away now? We cut to Crow, walking down the streets of Argus. Voices in his head start to get louder and louder. Various things Ruby, Yang, Oscar, and the others have said over the years. As they get louder, we also hear Raven's voice, Ty's voice, Clover's voice. He stops when the sound of a laughing baby interrupts his thoughts. He looks up, seeing that he's in front of the Kata Ark home, and he can see through the window that Saffron and Terra are chatting while eating dinner and feeding Adrian. Crow stumbles back, pulling up his collar, shuffling quickly away, the world darkening again, the buzzing returning, and Crow's breathing heavily. We see him entering a building. It's too bright in here. We see him handing the clerk Lien. He's leaning on the counter, holding his head like he has a headache. He exits the building quickly, tucks down a nearby alley, and we can see he's holding a brown paper bag with a bottle inside of it. Crow opens the bottle and starts to bring it to his mouth, hesitates, tries again, hesitates. Finally, he brings it to his mouth, and he starts to tilt his head back when, You idiot! Maria's sharp voice cuts through all the noise. Crow jumps at her voice, saying, Maria, what are you doing here? I knew you tried to do something stupid. Now give that to me now. She holds out her hand open expectantly. Crow doesn't move. He quietly says, But I need it. And Maria shakes her head. No, you don't. Drinking that stuff won't bring everyone back. But it'll make me forget about it. It'll make everything stop hurting so bad if I could just forget about it, just for a while. But do you really want to forget about your nieces? About the ones you love? Maria steps closer to Crow, her hand still outstretched. Crow pulls the bottle back, but instead, Maria grabs hold of his empty hand. I know it hurts to remember, and I know you've hurt a lot in life, but drinking that stuff won't make the hurt really go away. Because no matter how much you drink, you will eventually sober up. And once that happens, you'll just hurt so much more. And you know that's not what Ruby, Yang, and all the others would have wanted to see you turn into. Crow sighs and nods, handing Maria the bottle. Maria tips it over, pouring all of the contents onto the ground. And as she does, Crow says, I walked past Jean's sister's place. I figured I should tell them, but I don't know how to say it. Maria shakes the bottle, making sure it's really empty, and she places it in a nearby trash can. Well, she says, turning back around and holding onto his hand again. I can try to help you with that. Come on, let's go talk to them. Crow and Maria walk down the sidewalk together. We cut to Ruby, Blake, Yang, and Lattice walking along a forested path. The girls are all talking with each other. Basically, another good moment for them to just talk, develop, express their thoughts and feelings with each other. After a bit of conversation, Yang asks Lattice if she's human or not, or if she's like those lost creatures. Lattice explains that she's not like the monsters, because she can talk, and they don't. She lets slip that there's others like her, and when they ask her about it, she says she doesn't like them, because they always try to make me do boring things, like go to school. I don't want to do that. I want to explore all these cool places. As they're talking, we see something creeping through the trees, and the girls notice just in time as we see two lost creatures leaping out at them, the white rabbit and the march hare. They fight for a bit, when the two creatures seem to transform together into one very large, bunny-like creature. The girls decide to run, and as it gives chase, we hard cut back to Crow and Maria. We don't hear anything except for melancholic music, but we see them speaking to Saffron and Tara, then consoling the two women, leaving, and returning to the base. Maria sighs, saying she needs to go to bed. She's too old to be staying up running around the town anymore. Harriet and Elm have returned, and they seem to be arguing in another room nearby with Marrow and Robin. Crow notices a light on in one of the other rooms and goes to find Pietro. He's at a desk, writing something down on what looks like a journal, and Crow can see a picture of Penny next to him on the table. Crow takes a deep breath and calls out to Pietro, who smiles and softly says, Did you need something? Crow asks how he's doing, you know, with everything that's happened, how he's holding up. Pietro picks up the picture of Penny and sadly says, I've lost Penny twice now. I don't know how many parents could say that about their children. 
I wish I could say it was easier this time, but it's not. I don't think something like this can be easy. I could try to bring her back again, rebuild her again, sacrifice even more of my aura again, but at this point I think I need to decide to let the dead rest. Man really aren't meant to play God. Crow says, I wish I could have taken their place, you know. I've made mistakes. I've lived my life. They were all so young still. Their whole future still ahead of them. But I'm still here. It's not fair. It should have been me. Pietro turns in his chair and faces Crow. Doesn't seem fair, does it? The two men are quiet for a moment when Crow takes a deep breath and says, Do you want to talk about her, Penny? Pietro smiles and says, Do you want to talk about your nieces? Yeah. Crow says, walking up and sitting down in another chair next to him. They start talking about the things their presumed dead loved ones enjoyed, and we fade away, transitioning back to vacuo. Ren is rather emotionless, handing out food to people. Team Sun are talking, making jokes, having fun. Ren responds with a hmm every now and then, but he's clearly not really paying attention to them. Ren stops, noticing someone coughing heavily, spitting out the half-eaten apple that they had in their mouth. Suddenly, more and more people start coughing, retching, stumbling over, seemingly passing out. Ren and Team Sun look around, confused, as the refugees start panicking. As more people cough, more people panic. Jumping up, running around, screaming, crying. Sun tries to calm them down, but no one's listening. They can't even hear him over all the coughing sounds. Ren looks down at the barrel of food he's holding and pulls out a pear. He looks at it for a second and then crushes it in his fist and watches as a familiar purple goo squeezes out of it. Ren gasps, and we hard cut to the middle of the desert, seeing the horde of Grimm heading towards the academy, attracted to the panicked refugees. End of the episode. Episode 8, Revealed. Ruby, Yang, Blake, and Lattice are running through the trees, still trying to escape the massive bunny monster behind them. Yang and Ruby fire pot shots at it while Blake is carrying Lattice. Lattice yells out, That way, that way, pointing down a specific little path. The girls follow her directions. As the chase continues, we transition to Weiss and Jean. Jean draws his newly finished sword, showing off the fixed blade, now shining with shades of orange and yellow. Hopefully I won't have to do any more upgrades for a long while, he says. Weiss turns distracted at a roaring sound, followed by gunfire and crashing noises. Jean says, what is that? Weiss, listening to the sound of Yang and Ruby's bullets, seemingly recognizes them and says, is it really? As her voice trails off, the top of the trees gets blasted off, revealing the bunny, and a roar is stomping into the village. Weiss and Jean draw their weapons as the civilians rush away from the monster. Neo looks around at the panicked civilians around her and starts to creep towards Jean and Weiss, pulling out her hidden blade. Just then, though, Weiss stops as she hears Ruby yell out, Come on, this thing won't quit! And suddenly Weiss gasps as Ruby's semblance bursts through the trees, barreling towards her and Jean. Just before it reaches her, though, the red spiraling stops and Ruby is standing right in front of Weiss, rose petals floating around them as they both gasp seeing each other. Weiss! Ruby yells happily. Ruby? As the girls all stop, shocked, the bunny monster comes crashing in. Ruby, Weiss, Blake, Yang, and John all have a big cool battle with it, and Neo puts the knife back away and slips back into the crowd. The heroes finally kill it, and the crowd of people cheer. Rosalind and Whitney thank them for protecting their people, stopping in the tracks when they see Lattice hiding behind Ruby's cape. Whitney screams in shock, saying, Oh my dear sweet girl, where have you been? We've been worried sick! Rosalind walks up, holding out her arms, and says, Come here to your mommies! Lattice pouts and trudges up to the much taller women, who instantly start doting on her. As the girls watch nearby, Weiss turns and jumps into a big hug with Ruby, and Yang, Blake, and Jean all join in on the group hug. We transition to the civilians, packing up food and water and other supplies, while Weiss, Ruby, Yang, Jean, and Blake stand nearby, also packing necessities. Weiss hands Blake her gamble shroud, saying, I believe this belongs to you. She laughs and Blake gasps happily. Thank goodness, if I had to use that scythe one more time, I was gonna lose it. The two laugh as Ruby says, I didn't think you had fallen too, talking to Weiss and Jean. Is there anyone else here, like Ren or Nora? No, I was the last one to fall, Jean says. I saw as all the portals got closed off. So then, Yang says tentatively, you know what happened to Penny, right? The room goes quiet and Weiss turns sadly towards Jean. He nods and Yang says, and Cinder? When she killed her, did she get the maiden powers too? Jean and Weiss blink, startled as they realize the others wouldn't actually know who killed Penny. Weiss stammers and says, Um, well, no, we saw that Winter actually got the maiden powers. Well, that's great news, Blake says, trying to sound positive, but still feeling the tension around them. Jean says, Yeah, but, um, actually, Cinder didn't kill Penny. Uh, 
His voice trails off and Ruby stares intently at him. Actually, I... I was the one who did it. Ruby leaps to her feet. What? She yells furious. Why? Why would you do that? How could you do that? Jean interrupts her quickly by saying, She asked me to, Ruby. She was hurt and it was her last wish that I helped her... Ruby interrupts him, now screaming. You could have healed her with your semblance! You didn't have to do that! How could you do that to her? Ruby, stop, please, Jean says, trying to calm things down again. No, Ruby yells, fighting back tears. No, she's gone, again, and it's all your fault! How dare you! How dare- This time, Weiss steps up to interrupt Ruby. Ruby, please! She grabs Ruby's shoulders, trying to calm her down. It was what Penny asked for. It's not like Jean wanted to do it, but it's what she wanted. Ruby is quiet and then turns and walks away. Jean chases after her. Yang sighs, rubbing her eyes. What a mess. Blake suddenly gasps and jumps to her feet. Wait, she says sharply. We're all here. Even everyone from Mantle and Atlas. Everyone who fell off of Ambrosius's pads. That means Neo should be here, too. At the sound of her name, we see Neo gasp within the crowd. She starts to step away from them, hiding further behind the civilians. What? Ying yells, also jumping to her feet. Neo? Yes, Blake says. When I fell with Ruby, Ruby had been holding on to Neo when Cinder knocked them both off. Why says, well, then where is she? We've been all over the island by this point. Blake's ears lay flat. She could be anywhere, or anyone. Her semblance lets her disguise herself. Wait, Ying says. Semblances. Have you two seen it? Every time one of us use our semblance around here, the plants light up, or shake, or do something. Weiss turns towards the crowd. So if she's hiding here already, then that would mean... We suddenly see vines shaking and flowers lighting up as someone darts away from the crowd and into the jungle. Stop, Yang roars, running after her. Yang's eyes are trained on the trail of glowing flowers as Neo runs away. Neo, full sprint, starts to shimmer as her disguise drops and we see her true form. As she does, the flowers stop glowing around her. Stop! Yang yells again and launches a bullet that shatters a tree. Yang reaches the destroyed tree and looks around. There's no more signs of movement and no more signs of a semblance being used. Neo seemingly has escaped. Yang yells out in anger and Blake and Weiss catch up to her. Blake puts a hand on her shoulder saying, Come on, there's no point chasing after her. But what if she comes back? Yang asks. Why says, we'll warn everyone to be on the lookout for a girl with pink and brown hair, or if the plants seem weird around someone. But Blake's right. There's no point wasting our time and energy chasing after her. Yang sighs heavily and shakes her head. We cut back to Ruby, who's sitting sadly at one of the tables in front of Ambrosius's workstation. Jean comes and sits down next to her. She doesn't say anything, and Jean chuckles. It's funny, usually you're the one trying to give me advice. She still doesn't say anything, and Jean continues. Remember back in Beacon, when I was working for Cardin because he threatened to reveal my transcripts? You were the one who helped me figure that all out. I don't want to talk, Jean, Ruby says quietly. Jean sighs and nods. I understand, he says, but let me just get something off of my chest, okay? Ruby doesn't respond, so Jean keeps going. I really hated having to do that to Penny. It, it sort of reminded me of Pira. Ruby finally looks over to him. He keeps talking. At first... I was supposed to protect her and the previous Fall Maiden, but I turned my back, and Cinder was able to get the powers instead. Then afterwards, I couldn't stop Pyrrha from chasing after her. He looks at Ruby. I didn't want to sit back and just watch as Cinder took another life right in front of me. Ruby sighs and a single tear falls down her cheek. Jean says, Penny was adamant that that's what she wanted. She wanted to make a choice, and it didn't feel right for me to take that choice away from her. And I am so sorry, Ruby. I wish I could have done something different. Maybe say something to her, stop Cinder sooner, anything, but I couldn't. And I'm very, very sorry. It should have been me, Ruby says quietly, wiping away her tears. I should have been the one to do it. Jean chuckles and says, I think if you were there, you wouldn't have been able to bring yourself to do it to her. Yeah, you're probably right, Ruby says. Ugh, it's it's not fair. It was easy when I thought it was Cinder who did it. I could be mad at Cinder. I'm just so angry and I hate it. I want to be mad. I, I, I want someone to blame. Someone to be mad at. I want to be mad at you for doing it. To be mad at Penny for making that choice. But, but, but that's not fair. Ruby sighs and places a hand on John's shoulder. I can't be mad at you or Penny. That's not true, John says, putting a hand on top of hers. You can be mad at me. I'm mad at me too. Mad I couldn't do anything else. It's okay to be angry about situations like this. When Pyrrha died, 
I was so angry. All the time. You saw how quickly I would snap at people. And it took me a long time to get over that anger, to come to terms with it. No one's asking you not to be angry, not to feel this way. You lost a friend. That's gonna take some time to get to terms with. But just know that I'm here to help you through it. So is Weiss, Yang, Blake, and when we get back to the others, they'll all be there for you too. Roby sighs and picks up her head. Thank you, Jean. We see them smile and nod to each other before transitioning back to the civilians. They're finishing their preparations. Yang, Weiss, and Blake are telling them what to look out for with Neo, and Jean and Ruby return. Whitney and Rosalind step up and say, Are you leaving our domain now? And they say yes, and Rosalind points to a specific winding path. This road will take you up to the top of the Yggdrasil tree, and be careful. It's rather small and winding. You'll have to walk single file for most of it. Whitney says, there's also a very large lost creature that lives near the top of the tree, but it's usually sleeping, though it'd be best if you try to stay quiet and cautious. The heroes thank the two women and start leading the civilians towards the large tree. As we watch them leave, we cut back to Whitney and Rosalind. Rosalind is spinning in circles, looking around. Lattice Calloway? Lattice Calloway, where are you, dear? Whitney groans and says, Does that girl run off again? The two women call out to Lattice as we see her peek out from behind a building, giggle, and then chase after Team Ruby. End of the episode. Episode 9, The Point of Power. We're in vacuo. Everyone is rushing around. Team Sun are running around trying to stop people from eating the fruit they've been passing out. Team Coffee are on the outskirts of the school, staring in shock as a large swarm of Grimm's suddenly start charging towards them. What the hell is happening, Coco yells. We see Nora, Emerald, and Oscar running down the halls of the school, looking out windows to see the panicked refugees and the incoming horde of Grimm. We then hear Ren shouting, running down the halls to join up with them. Poison, he yells. The food's been poisoned. Poison, Nora asks. How? Tyrion, Emerald gasps, realizing what must have happened. They are here. Tyrion and Mercury, they must be hiding somewhere. We have to help them, Nora says, starting to run off, but Oscar grabs her arm. No, they wouldn't have poisoned people just for the heck of it. It's a distraction. We can't just ignore all the grim that's coming in. This will be just like Mantle all over again, Nora says. Emerald responds with, Team Coffee is already out there. They should be able to handle this on their own. A whole horde of grim, Nora says. We can't let them... Before she finishes her sentence, a sudden whooshing sound flies past the window, as they look out to see Winder flying through the air, swords drawn heading towards the Grimm. Above them from an open window, they hear Tatiana yell, Winter, come back! Tatiana growls angrily and starts running down the stairs. Team Honor run up to intercept her. Out of my way, kids, she says sternly. Wait, Oscar says, getting in her way. The Grimm is just a distraction. Salem's forces are here, and they're probably using the Grimm to draw everyone's attention away so they can get to you or the relic. Tatiana groans, clenching her fists, and Winter just flew right on out there. That girl needs to learn she can't just dive into every single battle. But she's a maiden, Nora says. She's strong enough to beat all the Grimm on her own. And she's also a giant glowing blue target, Tatiana says sternly. If Salem's toads are here, trying to get to me or the sword, then what's stopping them from also trying to get to the Winter Maiden right now, too? We cut to Tyrion and Mercury, sneaking around the outskirts of the school. Tyrion gasps happily as he sees Winter flying through the air, blasting beams of ice at the incoming Grimm. Mercury glances at her and slaps Tyrion's shoulder. Focus, Tyrion. We're here for the Summer Maiden and the Relic of Destruction. Tyrion grimaces at him and says, Well, if we get the chance, we might as well try to kill two birds with one stone, right? Mercury frowns and says, It's not like either of us could get the powers from her anyway. Pay attention to our mission. Tyrion doesn't say anything, but he quietly laughs to himself, giving Winter one last glance, then turns and uses the end of his robotic stinger to open a latch of a window, as the two of them quietly crawl into the building. We cut back to Honor and Tatiana. Nora is frustrated and says, If you have the power of a maiden, then it's your duty to protect the people as best you can. What's the point of having real magic and all that power if you just hide away and leave everyone for dead? Tatiana says, It's called being safe, kid. I didn't live this long as a maiden by running out there playing hero every time a couple of Grimm came through. Nora frowns and says, Yeah, you lived that long because you're a coward. Before they can say anything else, Nora runs out and jumps out the window, her grenade launcher changing in her hands so she can ride on it and flies through the air, heading off towards the direction of winter. Nora! Ren yells after her. He groans angrily and slams his fist into the windowsill, turning to Oscar. What are we supposed to do? Tatiana pushes past them and says, I'm going down to the vault. If those creeps want to take me or the relic, then they'll have to get to me first. 
Oscar watches her go and glances out the window after Nora and groans holding his head. Okay, he says. Ren, Emerald, you go after Tatiana. Help protect her as best you can. I'll go after Nora. Will you be okay on your own? Emerald asks as he starts to run off. He glances over his shoulder and we see his eyes flash. And Ozpin says, we'll be fine. Just go. Ren and Emerald nod and run after Tatiana. We cut back to Team Ruby and the civilians, heading down a path, stopping just before they reach the trunk of the tree. They all gasp, craning their necks back to stare up at the tall, towering tree above them. We have to climb all the way up there, a civilian says. A child civilian says, if we do, will we get to go home? How long will this take? Another one says. Weiss raises an arm and says, calm down, everyone. It's going to be fine. She turns and points to the path like a little carved walkway that spirals up the trunk of the tree. Just like Rosalind had mentioned, it's small and they'll have to walk single file. Sean takes a step, drawing his sword and shield. He goes, me, Ruby, and Weiss will take the lead. Yang and Blake will defend the rear. So everyone, let's go. Single file, follow me. Jean leads the way. Some of the kids in the crowd put their hands on each other's shoulders, just like they did when they were crossing the streets of Mantle. Ruby walks in front of Weiss, both also on the lookout for Neo or any of the lost creatures. As they climb up the tree, Ruby says, Do you think that big lost creature will be awake up there? I hope not, Weiss says. But knowing our luck, when has anything actually ever gone without a hitch? Ruby giggles and looks around. They've started to climb up to the point where they're seeing the tops of the trees of the island. What do you think these lost creatures are? They don't look like Grimm. They don't look like animals, either. I don't know, Weiss says, thinking about it. One thing I've noticed is they don't seem to be attracted to negative emotions, like how the Grimm do. Hey, you're right, Ruby says. I didn't even think about it. We go over to Yang and Blake. Yang in the very rear of the whole pack. She keeps looking over her shoulder suspiciously. And Blake says, don't worry so much. You know Neo will try to attack us. I'm not going to be caught off guard this time, Yang says bluntly. Rustling leaves behind them catch their attention, and Yang spins around quickly. Walking out from behind a tree branch is Lattice, giggling as she peeks after them. Lattice, Blake says, what are you doing here? You should go back to your mother's. Sorry, Lattice says, stepping up towards them. I just wanted to explore some more. You all are so interesting. We'll go back home, now, Yang says firmly, the trained voice of an older sister. I mean it. This is dangerous, and it's already dangerous enough for you out there. Lattice droops, frowning. She whimpers and runs back down the path. Blake puts a hand on Yang's shoulder, motioning for them to catch back up to the rest of the crowd. Wow, Yang, did you have to be so firm with her? Blake says, chuckling to herself. Yang says, ah, you have to be stern when they're that young, otherwise they won't take you seriously. Ruby was the same exact way. She was always trying to follow me around, go wherever I went. When I first went to school without her, she tried to follow me halfway down the road. Well, it's a good thing you're a good older sister, Blake says. They look out over the horizon, seeing that they're now well above the tops of the trees. Do you think this will work? I don't know, Yang says, but at this point, I really don't think we can afford to be picky with our options. Leaves Russell behind them and Yang sighs, turning around. Lattice, I told you to go back. Yang's sentence gets cut off as we see Neo charging up the path, the blade in her hands as she fills the camera and we cut back to Vacuo. Team Coffee are killing Grimm and Mass, but Winter is clearly doing the most out of all the fighters. Her giant magical attack sends tons of Grimm flying, disintegrating as they die. A loud battle roar catches Winter's attention, and she turns to see Nora flying in. Her scar is glowing as her hammer charges up an electrical shot, and she crushes a large Grim to death in one blow. Nora joins the battle, and they kill more and more Grim together. Ozpin runs up soon afterwards and also joins the fray. Finally, the Grim seem to be mostly done for. Team Coffee and some other vacuo citizens chase off the last of them. Winter turns to Nora and says, What started the rampage? Nora says, Apparently Salem's forces poisoned some of the food. But Winter, she grabs hold of Winter's wrist before the maiden could fly away. Thank you for fighting. For not hiding like all the other maidens. I don't care what Tatiana says. This is what being a maiden should really be about. Winter gives her a long look, then a nod, and flies back towards the school. Nora sighs as she watches Winter fly away, and Oscar reunites with her. We cut to Emerald and Wren, running down the halls of the school, chasing after Tatiana. Where even is the entrance to the vault, Emerald says. No idea, Wren answers. Well, how do we get into it? Emerald asks. No idea, Wren says again. They turn a corner and stop dead in their tracks. Running down the hall in front of them is Tyrion and Mercury. They stop and turn over their shoulders, hearing Emerald and Ren's footsteps. Tyrion laughs and just keeps running down the hall and bursts through a large door and out of sight. Mercury, however, doesn't move. Staring back at Emerald and Ren, realizing why he's seeing her here and why she's standing next to one of Ozpin's supporters. M, 
he says quietly. Ren runs forward, yelling, Emerald! Emerald shakes herself out of her own shock and puts a hand to her head, focusing. We hear a high-pitched noise, and from Mercury's perspective, Ren vanishes. Mercury looks around confused, and we can see Ren reappearing down the end of the hall, running through the same door Tyrion had ran through. Emerald takes a step closer to Mercury, and the two have a standoff, staring each other down. So, he says, you've decided to betray us? Or are you just trying to fool these kids into thinking you're their friend? Stop it, Mercury, Emerald says. She takes a step, and the two start to circle each other, still staring each other down. Mercury says, stop what? Being honest? What, you don't like hearing the truth about how you've betrayed Salem? I don't care about Salem, you know that, she says. Oh, that's right, he answers. You only care about Cinder. Is she even still alive anymore? How did she feel when you turned your back on her? I don't know. I mean, I mean, she doesn't know. It's not about her. Oh, he says, raising his hands mockingly. Now all of a sudden it's not about her? You trailed after her for years and years, desperate for her attention, and then at the drop of a hat suddenly it's not about her? Emerald says sharply, I stopped living in a fantasy, Mercury. I stopped relying on someone who clearly didn't care about me. Remember? You told me that. He scoffs and says, what a surprise. You have no loyalty. When Salem makes her new world order... What new world order? Emerald yells, suddenly stopping her circling motion. Mercury stops too, startled by her loud outburst. Wake up, Merc! It's fake! It's not real! She's promising you lies and you're eating it up like an idiot! Emerald takes a step closer to him. You honestly think Salem cares about making you some king or ruler or whatever? Some sort of new world order? All she wants to do is kill everyone, wipe every living soul off the planet to get back at Ozpin, and try to kill him once and for all. That's not true, Mercury says, taking a step closer to her. That's not what her plans are. And how do you know, Emerald says, taking another step closer. What exactly are you doing all this for? What is she actually planning on doing? Do you know? Does Tyrion? Hazel didn't know before he died. Hazel died, Mercury says quietly, taking a step backwards. Emerald, however, takes another step closer. Yes, Salem killed him. He's been following her orders for decades, and she just killed him. You think she cares about some dumb kids like us? The two stare each other down, and Mercury grimaces. You don't know anything. Emerald takes a deep breath, and then suddenly charges at Mercury, pulling out her weapons, her chains extending and spinning the blades in front of her. Mercury stumbles back, jumping backwards to do a handstand and launches two kicked bullets. Emerald jumps between the bullets and spins towards Mercury, who jumps back onto one foot and drops kicks Emerald. However, his boot flies through nothing, revealing it was just an illusion. Mercury gasps in shock and turns around, seeing just in time as Emerald runs through the door after Ren and Tyrion. End of episode. Episode 10, Fire and Crystals. The episode starts with a black screen, suddenly filling up with red lights, illuminating a long set of stairs. A regal door opens and Tatiana runs down the staircase. This is the inside of the vacuo vault. It has a pool of lava below an ornate stone path, large carved statues of who we can presume were previous summer maidens. Basically, imagine like a fusion between the fire temple in Ocarina of Time, but with the traditional Arabic architecture, like with the colors and the patterns. Anyways, the door of the vault matches that aesthetic, but with bright gold adornments just like the other vault doors. Tatiana steps in front of it and pulls out her weapon. It's a sword that's large and wide, basically like clouds from Final Fantasy. Attached to the end of the sword is a chain, and on the other end of that chain is a spiked morning star, about the size of a volleyball. The sword can also split open in half, revealing a fire dust infused shotgun that also superheats the blade of her sword. She stands at the ready, listening to the noises from above her, waiting for the threat to show its face. There's a battering and clattering sound, and a steel scorpion tail punctures through the doors of the elevator above the red staircase. Prying the door open, balancing on the walls of the empty elevator shaft, is Tyrion. He lurches forward and stares at Tatiana. There you are, he says. You're all there is, Tatiana says, laughing to herself. You're a spindly little thing, huh? No more than a bug. Tyrion laughs, his eyes narrowing, and says, On the contrary, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Tyrion charges forward at her, and they clash momentarily, before cutting to Neo slicing at Yang along the path of the tree. Yang blocks the attempted attack with her robotic arm, and with her left hand, she pops a quick punch out and knocks Neo in the gut. Neo flies back, and as she does, Yang turns around quickly, yelling, Run! Now! 
Panic ripples through the crowd and Jean yells out, Come on, let's hurry everyone! Ruby turns around and yells, Yang! Weiss grabs hold of Ruby's wrist, trying to have her keep up with Jean's pace. No, Weiss says. Come on, we have to guard the rest of them. I'm not letting Yang go again, Ruby says sternly, becoming a red blob of petals and flies around the tree towards Yang and Neo. Ruby, Weiss yells out angrily, then groans in frustration. She pulls out her sword and beckons the crowd to follow her. Come on, let's go. She leads them after Jean, away from the fight with Neo. Ruby flies through the air and lands in front of Yang, drawing her scythe. Blake also pulls out her blade and Yang says, Ruby, get out of here, I got this. No, Ruby says sternly. I won't let her get you again. Neo suddenly reaches forward again and deftly jabs at the three girls. They fight against Neo for a bit, struggling with the single file nature of the path they stand on. Ruby starts to fall, but uses her semblance to zip back up and onto the other side of Neo. Blake fires bullets past Yang's shoulders as Yang bobs and weaves like a boxer, throwing punches towards Neo. Weiss looks over at the edge of the tree and slashes her sword, using rock dust to create a large, flat surface next to them, giving the girls a larger platform to stand on for their fight. As she and Jean lead the civilians higher up, Weiss continues to create various platforms that jut out from the tree, some of stone, some of ice, some of wood. The battle continues between Neo, Yang, Blake, and Ruby. Jean and Weiss lead the crowd further up the tree, hurrying to get them away from the battle below. Jean looks up, seeing a light above them, realizing they're nearly there. Almost! Come on, let's get to the top as quickly as- He stops in his tracks and holds up his arms, shielding Weiss and the others and taking a step back. They all stop and a hush falls over the crowd. They stare straight ahead at a huge lost creature. It's a large, large, dragon-esque monster. It's the Jabberwocky. In the center of the tree, it seems to be a glowing white hole. The echoing of bullets from the battle below ring around the top of the tree branches, and the Jabberwocky blinks awake at the noise, and a rumble comes from its throat as it notices the human intruders. Go back! Go back! Jean and Weiss yell. The civilians push their way backwards and duck just in time as a strange blast from the Jabberwocky's mouth hits where they were just standing. Its breath attack is like a light blue, and it looks like fire, but what's left behind turns into beautiful crystals. What do we do? Jean asks. Weiss looks around back and forth at the Jabberwocky and at the fight below them with Neo. Come on, she yells, using her rock dust to create a path jutting out nearby, and leads the civilians onto it. The Jabberwocky makes a strange roaring sound and looks around, seemingly noticing the battle below with Neo, and starts to clamber around the branches towards them. Neo, Ruby, Yang, and Blake pause momentarily as a dark shadow envelops them, but Yang uses that moment to charge at Neo, her semblance activating as she attempts to land a huge punch on her. But Neo avoids the hit, transforming into Blake as she does. Yang stumbles, confused as her semblance fades, and Neo does a high kick to the bottom of Yang's jaw. Blake reaches forward and slashes at Neo, who falls backward, grabbing onto one of Weiss's various dust structures and swinging around it. As she spins around, she suddenly looks like Sun and lands a kick on Blake's shoulder. Ruby spins her scythe and uses the blade of the scythe to pin Neo between her blade and the trunk of the tree. Neo smiles and transforms into Penny. Ruby gasps, looks horrified for a second, and then suddenly looks furious. Ruby lets go of her scythe and grabs Neo's collar. Startled, Neo doesn't have time to react as Ruby lands a hefty punch right on Neo's cheek. As she does, Neo's illusion fades slightly before returning, and Ruby rolls back for another punch, saying, Don't you dare look like her, you monster! Ruby punches at her again, and Neo squirms enough where she can shove Ruby off of her and slashes at Ruby with her blade. Ruby falls back and stumbles off the tree, and Blake throws her ribbon to save her. Ruby grabs hold of it, and Blake spins, pulling Ruby back up to them. Ruby uses this momentum to launch at Neo again, who ducks barely out of the way and charges towards Yang instead. Ruby grabs hold of her scythe again, and Neo transforms again to look like Cinder. She rushes towards Yang, but before she can reach her, suddenly a large, clambering shape of the Jabberwocky's claws slams into the trees between them. It stumbles around, balancing on the branches of the tree, and swats at them a bit like a cat swatting at toys. Neo does her best to ignore it and launches into Yang again, dropping her transformation to look like herself. We then cut back to Tatiana, fighting Tyrion. The two battle for a while. Tyrion seems to be too quick for her, and she keeps taking huge strides to chase him down. Tyrion laughs skinly as Tatiana's eyes glow, and she closes the gap between them, chasing him around the vault. We then cut to Ren, rushing towards a stone sculpture. A hidden opening has been pried open by Tyrion, revealing a secret elevator within. Ren looks inside of it and sees that Tyrion has tore through the bottom of the elevator and slid down the elevator shaft on his own. Ren groans, looking at the destroyed wires and circuitry, realizing the elevator isn't going to work anymore. 
Let's go, Emerald yells behind him. He turns around to see Emerald running down the hall towards him. Hurry, she yells. We can't, he says back. As Emerald catches up, he shows her the destroyed wires and she whispers, damn it, under her breath. She turns quickly over her shoulder, hearing Mercury chasing after them. Come on, she whispers, grabbing Ren's arm and pulling him aside. They hide behind a curtain and Mercury runs in. Emerald puts her hand to her head and a high-pitched noise can be heard. Mercury runs up and, in his eyes, the elevator looks perfectly fine. As he charges into it, his foot slips through the hidden gap in the floor. With a lurch and a crunching sound, suddenly the busted elevator loses its grip and starts to descend with his legs stuck in the hole Tyrion made. Oh my gosh, Emerald yells, startled. She and Ren run up, looking down into the elevator shaft, and watches as Mercury screams as he disappears into the darkness of the elevator. Mercury pulls himself up out of the hole into the elevator, doing a high kick that launches a bullet, punching a hole out of the top of it. With his other leg, he does another kick, and it launches him up through the hole he just made. He does a splits maneuver, and his metal legs kick up sparks on the walls of the elevator shaft as he stops his descent. He watches the remains of the elevator disappear below him and booms loudly at the bottom of it all. He glances up above his head and sees Emerald and Ren in the distance. He sneers at them and then brings his legs in, falling confidently down the rest of the elevator shaft. Ren and Emerald jump down after him. Back with Tyrion and Tatiana, Tatiana stops, startled by the booming of the destroyed elevator behind her. Tyrion takes the opportunity to slash at her with his blades. She roars angrily, her eyes flashing even more, and charges at him. Gotcha, he says, and slides out of her reach. As he parries her, he wraps his tail around her ankle and Tatiana stumbles forward, landing hard in front of the relic door. As she tries to pull herself back up to her feet, Tyrion's tail jams into the back of her neck and she screams as her aura shatters. She squirms painfully under his stinger and he grabs her wrist. The two wrestle with each other for a bit, but with his poison weakening her, Tatiana can't help but have him slam her hand into the relic door. Her maiden touch activates it, and it starts to open, designed to look like spiraling firecrackers as it opens ornately. Another slamming sound is heard behind them, and Tyrion glances over his shoulder as Mercury clambers through the elevator wreckage and down the red steps towards him. Hurry up! There's more on their way! Tyrion laughs and says, Finish off the dog. I'll get the sword. Tyrion slips through the door as it's still in the process of opening. Tatiana struggles to get onto her feet, her arms shaking as poison falls down around her shoulders. Mercury hesitates and starts to walk towards Tatiana when Ren and Emerald also push their way through the door behind him. Emerald and Ren immediately let loose a barrage of bullets and Mercury runs to avoid the fire as best he can. Tyrion runs through the realm of the relic, it's designed to look like a beautiful fall realm, and an ornate gold and blue sword floats above a cobblestone circle in the ground. Tyrion rushes towards it and Tatiana groans, finally pulling herself to her feet and leaning on the door behind him. She lifts a hand and launches a huge fireball towards Tyrion. The fire destroys everything, and Tyrion scrambles to evade her massive attack. Tatiana stumbles, coughing up some purple mess, and her magic falters. Her glowing eyes flicker slightly, and she looks back down at her own hand. Emerald, Ren, and Mercury fight, and Tyrion laughs, seeing his opportunity now that Tatiana is faltering so much. He runs forward, laughing hysterically as he grabs hold of the handle of the sword. A screeching sound happens behind him. Tyrion turns, and his smile starts to fade. Tatiana's hand is outstretched again, and now the door to the ethereal fall-like realm is closing back up. No, Tyrion yells, running towards the quickly closing door. No, he screams again and slashes the sword. A dark magical beam flies off the blade and into the camera. End of the episode. Episode 11, Home. Winter is flying back towards the school. The refugees are getting treatment and it seems like things have calmed down a bit, and Nora and Oscar chase after Winter, calling out to her as she flies overhead. The three stop suddenly, and a large dark bluish purple force blasts through the side of the school. People jump up and run away from the blast, and Winter and Nora stare at the gigantic hole left in its wake. Ozpin says a mournful no as he looks at all the damage. We cut back down to Tyrion holding the Sword of Destruction, that same dark bluish purple light emanating from the sword. He smiles as we pan back, revealing the gigantic slash in the walls of the door to the fall-like realm the sword was being held in. There's daylight peeking into the vault chamber now. A giant gap has been ripped open by the sword's power, cutting all the way through the layers of the earth and stone and the building. Mercury, Emerald, and Wren have been knocked over by the power of the blast. Mercury looks around, confused at everything around him. He looks tired and stares up at the daylight coming into the room. 
He stops and stares back at the refugees who's staring back down into the room below. He blinks at their scared faces, kids holding onto their parents' legs and hands, and Mercury stares back at them. Bren and Emerald look around and gasp. Tatiana lay in front of them, her chest heaving. She's alive. Tyrion's strike didn't kill her. But as the camera pans back, we see that it did gash open her side and sliced off one of her arms. She breathes heavily as red blood and purple poison pool beneath her. Tyrion crawls through the opening and stands over her, sneering down at her. Look at you, crawling around on the floor, he says. Who looks like a bug now? He laughs to himself and Tatiana struggles trying to lift her sword, but she's too weak by now. Winter's yelling catches Tyrion's attention and he looks up just in time to see Winter fly through the opening of the ceiling. She pulls her swords out, headed towards Tyrion, and he lifts the sword of destruction and slashes upward. Another dark blast shoots out and Winter gasps, barely flying to the side enough to avoid the destruction blast as it tears through more of the school and endlessly to the sky. Tatiana drops her sword and grabs Tyrion's ankle. She pulls his foot and he falls down next to her. Winter flies forward again. Nora, carrying Oscar with her, flies in behind Winter on her grenade launcher. Ren! Nora yells out, seeing Ren and Emerald on the floor nearby. Nora flies over to them and Oscar starts to help them to their feet. A loud sound echoes behind them and they have just enough time to dive out of the way of Mercury's bullets. He stands shakily, looking back and forth between Team Honor, Tyrion fighting Winter, and the refugees who are still staring down at the battle. Ren roars and charges at Mercury. Mercury fights, bouncing between the members of Team Honor. Winter slashes at Tyrion. He rolls to avoid the attack, but her blades slap the Relic of Destruction out of his grasp. He scrambles out of Tatiana's grasp and he and Winter battle with each other, trying to reach the sword first or knock it further away from one another. The two battles intersect and a huge fight between Team Honor, Winter, Tyrion, and Mercury plays out, with Tatiana shooting off sporadic blasts of magic as best she can. As the fight continues, Winter flies up and releases a barrage of electrical strikes. Mercury stumbles to avoid the attack, but sparks bounce into his boots and high-pitched whirring sounds happen, followed by clouds of snoke pouring out of them. Mercury stumbles and try to kick out a bullet, but only more smoke comes out. Damn it, he hisses. Nora runs into one of the electrical blasts, charging up her semblance, and her scar is glowing pink. Emerald rushes towards Tyrion, and he goes to stab at her with his tail, but it goes through her, revealing it's just an illusion. As Tyrion stumbles forward from the trick, we see the real Emerald rolling over and grabbing onto the Relic of Destruction, then seemingly vanishes with another illusion. As Tyrion fumbles, Nora, fully charged up, slams her hammer into the stinger of his tail. Electricity runs through Tyrion, and the head of the stinger shatters from the hit. Tyrion spins backwards, and Winter's eyes glow, and she clenches a fist. Stones burst out of the ground, trapping Tyrion in place. He turns to Mercury, who still has smoke pouring out of his boots. Mercury glances around and mutters, screw this. He turns and tries to run. Ren uses the cords of his guns to wrap around him, and Mercury kicks and yanks Ren's guns out of his hands and slips out of his grasp. As he does, though, he stumbles and starts to fall towards the lava below. Emerald reappears, still holding the sword, and yells out, No! It looks like Mercury's going to fall into the lava. He's kicking furiously, his boots making sad clicking sounds. Suddenly, though, one of his boots lights up briefly and a bullet launches, and he uses this brief momentum to push himself up towards the gashed opening to the surface. Emerald gasps, reaching a hand out towards him. Coward, Tyrion screams as he stares after Mercury. Coward! Mercury's feet kicks, trying to find a foothold as he holds on for dear life. Emerald's eyes widen as members of the crowd grab hold of various weapons. Mercury scrambles to pull himself up, but it looks like he is going to fall into the lava below. Suddenly, a huge blast of wind erupts from the opening behind him, pushing Mercury up and tumbling onto solid ground. The torrent of the wind kicks up dust, obscuring everyone's vision, and they cover up their faces to block the sudden sandstorm. As it fades, Team Sun run up, but as they look around, Mercury seems to have escaped during the sudden storm. We cut back down to Team Honor. Tyrion's screaming and struggling to free himself, but he's trapped. Winter yells out and flies over to Tatiana. Winter brushes a lock of Tatiana's hair out of her face, and her head shifts lifelessly to the side. Winter tears up. Tatiana is dead. Nora shakes her head, scrambling to her feet. Wait, she says. The powers! Who's... Her voice trails off as Oscar and Ren turn to look at Emerald, still holding onto the Sword of Destruction, breathing heavily as her eyes are glowing. Cut to Yang and Blake, avoiding a strike from Neo and the sweeping tail of the Jabberwocky. John and Weiss slash at it with their swords and using her dust. The Jabberwocky seems to be getting angry, beating its massive wings. 
The gust from the wings throws some civilians off the ledge of the tree. Blake uses her ribbon to save one, Ruby flies with her semblance to save another, and Weiss uses her stone dust to stop the rest from falling. At the same time, Neo stabs at Yang and we see Yang's aura shimmer. The battle continues for a bit, and Ruby sees how the Jabberwocky turns its attention to the civilians. Neo slashes at Ruby, her aura shimmering, and Ruby grabs hold of Neo and flies off with her, shoving Neo onto a separate stone landing. It's me you want, Ruby yells. So what are you waiting for? Neo growls and Ruby glances past her, seeing the Jabberwocky blasting its breath attack towards the others. Weiss uses dust to make a stone shield and they all brace themselves against the attack. Ruby raises her gun and fires three bullets. Neo easily avoids the shots and Ruby sees how her bullets instead fly into the back of the Jabberwocky's head, her real target. The creature turns around and roars. Before Ruby can do anything else, Neo slashes at her, punches at her, and then slams into Ruby, sending the two of them off the landing and onto another one further down. Ruby's aura breaks and Neo punches at her. Ruby kicks Neo off of her and tries to hold up Crescent Rose to block Neo's attack, but Neo kicks the scythe out of Ruby's hands. Neo towers over Ruby, a furious smile on her face. As Neo lifts up her blade, opening her mouth to scream, then, in a familiar fashion, Neo vanishes into the mouth of the Jabberwocky as the beast leans back and swallows Neo whole, finishing it off with a roar. Ruby scoffs and says, just like your boss. Ruby doesn't waste any time, scrambling and grabbing Crescent Rose again, flying back up to the others. What do we do, Weiss yells. John peeks around their stone shield and watches as the Jabberwocky turns back towards them with a hiss. That thing's coming back, he says. We can't stay here. Yang goes, we'll never make it out of here with that thing chasing us down. Couldn't we try to slip past it? Blake asks. Ruby says, I don't think so with that crystal breath attack it has. The Jabberwocky crashes into them and the crowd dashes to avoid its feet and tail. Team Ruby look around and Ruby looks down the length of the tree trunk. Her eyes widen and she says, do you three remember how we beat the Nevermore in the Emerald Forest? Blake, Yang, and Weiss look at Ruby. She says, what if we did that but backwards. The girls nod to each other, and Yang punches out several blasts of bullets, destroying a straight path through Weiss's dust landings down the length of the tree. Meanwhile, Jean keeps the Jabberwocky distracted with his shield blasts and sword strikes. Blake sets up her ribbon using branches of the tree, and Weiss brings up a glyph. Ruby launches into the ribbon to bring up its tension, and Weiss uses the glyph to hold her in place. They don't say anything to each other. Their eyes are focused on getting the shot right. Yang and Jean lure the Jabberwocky into position, and Weiss slashes her sword, releasing Ruby, who shoots out like a bullet. Ruby's firing bullets from Crescent Rose to help push her faster, and her scythe hooks onto the Jabberwocky's neck. She drags the beast down the length of the tree, before spinning sharply just before reaching the bottom, severing the head, and she lands coolly. Ruby sighs and looks back up the tree. We see the rest of Team Ruby, Jean, and the civilians cheering in celebration. Ruby smiles and takes a deep breath, straightening her her stance and squaring her shoulders. We then fade to Ruby, back on top of the tree with the others, as they all crowd next to the glowing center vortex in the center of the tree. We don't know how exactly this will work, Blake says to the civilians. If you don't want to risk this, you don't have to. One of the civilians glanced around at the others before saying, you've all helped us get this far. We'll stick with you. They all look back down and Ruby looks around at her friends before nodding. Let's go home. They all nod back to her, and Ruby takes a leap off the ledge and falls into the light and out of sight, followed by Weiss, Blake, Yang, Jean, and the others. The camera falls down with them and fades to a light white color, and a voiceover from Ruby starts up. Ruby says, This all almost feels like a dream. We see her face squinting through the light as she continues to fall, like I want to wake up from it and everything will be fine. We fade to see Crow sitting down to eat breakfast with Pietro and Maria, Robin and the Aesops in the distance getting their morning coffee and already bickering, it seems like. We see Crow smiling and talking to Pietro and Maria. Ruby's voiceover continues, I'll be with my family. We cut to see Team Honor. Ren, Nora, and Oscar approach Emerald, who shoves the sword into Oscar's hands, and she takes a step back, crying, her eyes still glowing like a maiden. Ruby's voiceover says, My friends. Winter puts a hand on Emerald's shoulder to comfort her, and Ruby's voiceover says, Around those who care and want to protect me. But I know this isn't a dream. We cut to Mercury running through the desert, stumbling in exhaustion and collapsing, fainting in the middle of the sand dunes. The bad things are still out there. Tyrion sighs within his stone trap and we see Tatiana's discarded sword nearby. We cut to Salem, back at her realm, and she lifts the staff. A blue light glows in front of her and Ruby says, Those evil people are still real. We cut to a beach covered in little red and black crabs and Penny's gravestone. Ruby says, 
and the ones who are gone are still gone. We then cut to Lattice, who, watching the rest of the civilians jumping down into the vortex, runs up and jumps in too. And Ruby says, there's still a lot of others who need to be protected. We cut back to Ruby, still falling down into the light. I can't change the past. I know that. I'm not dreaming, no matter how crazy all of this feels sometimes. But I'm gonna do my best to protect the future. Everything fades to pure white and then fades to black. We hard cut to Mercury, face down in the sand. The sky is dark now as the sun has started to set. He coughs and shakes, slowly gaining consciousness. A gust of wind batters his hair back and sand sputters around him. He grimaces and a voice says, Well, well, well. Mercury looks up and sees Cinder, with Melanie and Milsha on either side of her. A mistral airship behind them. Cinder goes, Aww, tell me, are you Salem's top dog yet? The Malachi twins laugh. Cut to black. Credits roll. Then, after all the credits, we fade to a quaint little marketplace, set up similar to like a farmer's market. People are chatting and shopping. We see someone adjust a shopping bag in his grasp, and he turns and we see it's Tai Yang. He thanks a vendor as he passes him his change, and he starts to walk away. Zwei, following by his ankles, suddenly stops and turns to look down a wooded area down the road. Zwei barks and runs off in that direction. Zwei! Ty says after him. He groans as Y disappears over the hill. Then seconds later, a crowd of people can be seen coming closer. Ty and all the other shoppers and vendors stop and stare in confusion as a small crowd of people shuffle forward, blinking into the sunlight, looking around confused. Their clothes are torn and dirty. Ty gasps and drops his bag of groceries. As the crowd gets closer, in the middle of the pack, we see Team Ruby. And Ruby bends down and picks up Zwei. She holds up her dog to her face, and then she laughs. End of volume nine. So yeah, I hope you liked this. It was a lot of fun thinking about how I would approach the volume. Thinking about how I would leave things off was probably the hardest part, but I had a lot of fun with it, and I hope you did too. I hope you liked my take on how I would do volume nine. And a big, big shout out to my $10 patrons, who are all so amazing. Nako, James Dodds, Cool Duck, Andrew, Ramiel, Valhalla Knight, Chamomile, G Extreme, Classy Critic, Sunny Shy, Azoth, Great Bar, Jake, Amber, Hype Man, Zero to Hero, Isaiah, Scaring Crows, Not All That Evil, Messiah Complex, Jacob, Virus, Ben's Sketchbook, The Watcher, Omega Fighter, and JP. So yeah, this was a big one. If you made it to the end, thank you. I hope you liked it. <laughs> I don't know if it was any good or not. It could be bad. I would love to hear your critiques and criticisms of my story structure or things or whatever. Any and all questions you might have, I'd love to clarify some things. I hope you just had fun with it, because I had fun with it too. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.